Reverend Wendy Hamilton, <laughs> who needs no introduction. But before we get started, I'm going to toss up here the donation link, <laughs> the website link, and the Twitter. <laughs> so make sure you follow her on Twitter. Thank you. Get over to the website, sign up to volunteer, and donate because we all know you can't win an election without some money and volunteers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And not necessarily in that order. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, so I'm going to drop these links in the chat as well later and go off of screen share now. Um, mm -hmm. Typically, how I usually run this is let you just do a little introduction of, you know, many of us have been following, so we are aware. But I think especially like the D.C. campaign or yeah. congressional race is something very new yeah. to a lot of us to so learning more about that. Yeah. And then we'll just open the floor up to questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll say to start one question per person, but if we get through the cycle and people have a second question or a follow-up, we'll come to that. Try to keep your question brief. Um, and to ask your question, just raise a Zoom hand. So if you don't know how to do that, go to participants and you'll see a little button that says raise hand and it'll put you in the queue or just write in the chat Zoom hand. That'll work as well. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, welcome, Reverend Wendy. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Megan. Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing tonight? I am just, whew, I am just so blessed, not just to be here. I mean, of course, yes, here, but every time I hear of movements, of organizations that are carrying on and carrying out the the vision that Andrew had back in 2018 when we were all kind of sitting around thinking, how's this thing going to work out? You know, it just, it just blows my mind because we, and he in particular, had no idea that uh, when he embarked upon his presidential campaign and, and the goal was to get his ideas and policies into the main discourse, None of us knew then, you know, back in 2018, that we'd be sitting here in 2021 with all kinds of organizations and, and, and small groups and, you know, Andrew's campaign suspended. And like you said, well, we're not letting it go. We're just going to keep it. I love it because we knew, we, I, mean, I can speak for myself. I knew from the time I met him and what he talked about he wanted to do in his vision, I knew it was bigger than him. I, that's why it drew me. That's why many of us became drawn to it because we understood that this man's on a mission. There's like a movement that, that is getting started here. And as you would, you know, come across people on the trail and say, you know, what's your gang story? You know, how, how did you get involved? And people say, I don't know. One morning I woke up, I heard him on a podcast and I just had to come. I mean, you know, it's just like amazing to watch this and to have seen the growth over time and now, you know, cash relief is mainstream. The big argument now is how, well, how much do we give people? You know, and it's like, yes. And pretty soon it's going to be, okay, now once you decide on an amount, can we make it recurring? So we have made a tremendous amount of progress, folks, in a very short amount of time. So please pat yourselves on the back or, you know, clap hands for yourself because you are doing an awesome job and you are carrying out a vision that is going to, uplift and support humanity. So I have to say thank you to everybody on the call for that. Now, <laughs> what am I doing running for Congress? <laughs> well, thank you for asking. <laughs> I have always been someone who's been much more supportive of, of presidential campaigns. You can't live in Washington, D.C. and not be politically curious or, or, or motivated. It just all of our news, everything that people talk about, you have to be abreast of what's happening, current events. I'm originally from Ohio. I, I was there till I was uh, 17. I consider DC my second home, my adult home, but my family's still in Ohio. So when I go back and try to talk politics, they're like, huh, what? You know, and I'm talking to them about what's happening, you know, and what's current. And they're like, okay, come with me to Walmart. You know, they, they're not even trying to have the conversation. So, so being here in DC, yes, I got swept up and I got caught up in everything that was happening. Um, I worked for the NAACP national headquarters here, did a lot of social justice outreach and advocacy around the death penalty. Uh, when, when Barack Obama's campaign got started, I was helping doing some phone banking and some volunteering and things 
like that. It really wasn't until Andrew's campaign came along and me getting involved that I actually took on an official role. And so in that official role, you get to see how the sausage is made, right? <laughs> you get to actually travel and find out what's going on and, and, and understand the thinking and the motivation. And so I have to say that having had that experience at the time, did not know that it was inspiring in me, even the thought of running for office. Once he uh, suspended the campaign, I was okay with that. I was ready to continue on helping with Humanity Forward, which I did start helping to pass out some of those early grants that we sent out, the $250 and $500 grants we did for social media. You know, I started helping do that. But, um, but again, still wasn't necessarily feeling like I was going to run for my own campaign. And then the summer of 2020 came around and a lot of civil rights leaders started passing away. John Lewis and C.T. Vivian and just folks who I felt like were um, such trailblazers in getting policies passed and, and upholding voting rights and civil rights and trying to stand for those things. And at that time, I wasn't sure how the election was going to turn out, right? I didn't know if if Trump was going to get another four years or not. So I was sitting there just feeling really upset about the fact that here are these gentlemen and women who have been trailblazers, who have gotten some progress made. And we have an administration in right now that's trying to undo all of the progress that was made. Now, from a personal perspective, um, the Trump administration kind of took a toll on me. I just, it was a lot. It, it was a lot. I know it was a lot for everybody. But for me, I really was not even sure had he won again, if I was going to be able to stay here. Now, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm saying that sort of facetiously because of course my grandson's here, my daughter's here. So I wouldn't have gone away, but there were times when I was like, if he gets in again, I might have to move to Belize or somewhere because I don't think I could make it um, another four years. So as those thoughts came to my mind, I said, well, I, I, I went into prayer. I'm a spiritual person, so I pray, I meditate about things like that. And so I felt like in prayer, I got this sense of, are you gonna tuck tail and run or are you gonna stay here and fight? And so I thought, well, I'm a fighter. So I guess, <laughs> I guess that's what I'm gonna have to do. And I'm gonna have to do it from a standpoint of being a voice, uh, for these policies, for these rights that are trying to be rolled back and for new ones that aren't even being entertained, I wanna be a voice to help carry those forward. So let me look at running here in DC. Now, for those of you who don't know much about DC, um, DC is separate and apart from Washington. One of the things that bothered me is that when people start talking about all the corruption and all the, the bad things that are happening in Washington, they sort of lump us in with everybody. But DC itself, there's 700,000 residents that live here in the city. Like we have to uh, go to work every day. You know, We're the ones who are feeling a huge brunt right now of the impact of 25,000 National Guard being downtown right now. So. All of our metro stations are closed down. All of these, you know, the, the streets and the perimeters are closed off. You know, friends are telling me that they can't even come from one side of town to the other without going through a checkpoint. Like, where am I living right now? You, you understand what I'm saying? Like, this is, this is what we're dealing with as residents. And so for me, I also just wanted to be someone who was a voice for those residents so that our needs did not get overlooked in talking about the needs of what was happening on the federal level, okay? So when you think about DC, the District of Columbia, we are divided into eight wards or eight districts. You know, we call them wards, but you could kind of call them small districts, each of them having roughly 100,000 people in them, all right? So we've got ward one, two, three, you know, one through eight, and they are made up of, of culturally diverse, economically, geographically, Every, we're just regular folks and we got a lot of culture. We got a lot of vibe. You know, we got a lot of things um, to offer here in DC. And we have some things that we want to do for ourselves, but we are not a state, okay? And that 
for me was also one of the things that I had to think about before I actually filed to run. With DC not being an official state, we are under federal jurisdiction in a sense that our budgetary uh, allocations, um, decisions on whether or not the National Guard can come in and protect us from um, insurrectionists, those decisions, we have to ask permission for those things to be granted. We do have a mayor, but we don't have like a governor because we're not a state. And so statehood for DC has been an ongoing request because we want to govern ourselves. We want to be able to make our own decisions, protect ourselves. We have the ability and the capacity to do what we need to do to get our needs met. And we want to also be included equally. We have more population than the state of Wyoming, than the state of Vermont, and yet we don't have statehood. And so that has been at the forefront of anybody who is running for office in DC. What we have right now is the delegate position. That's what I'm running for. The delegate to DC is a non-voting member. So as the delegate, I can, I can write bills. I can put my voice on the record. I can sponsor, I can co-sponsor. I can do everything except vote, which is kind of unfair to me because even the current delegate who's there in office, and let me say this, um, the current delegate, um, her name is Eleanor Holmes Norton. Some people may have heard of her. She's been um, you know, involved in civil rights uh, movements and things like that in the past. She, she is my elder. I will not run a campaign where I will speak negatively about Delegate Norton. She has a legacy. She has been in office in that role for 29 years. She is 83 years old. God bless her for what she has been able to do. What I would like to do is to carry the torch beyond statehood and start talking about once we get statehood, what's the message then? What is our plan? What are our policies moving forward? There's more and more talk about uh, UBI here in DC, for instance, and there's certain pockets, certain wards in the city that are doing UBI pilots or trying to get them up off the ground. But what I'm saying to them is once we become a state, then I can advocate for that to be statewide. I mean, certainly as a part of a federal UBI, but as a state, we can argue and we can, we can advocate for UBI for us as a state rather than having to do simply pilot projects in different parts of the city. So as your delegate, that's what I would like to do. I would like to carry the message forward. We are closer now to statehood than we've ever been. So let me say that too sort of encouraged me. The House took a vote in June and passed DC statehood for the first time. It passed through the House. And that was again, this past June. The Senate at that time said, it's dead on arrival in the Senate. And you wanna know why they said that? Does anybody, can anybody put in the chat if you think you know why the Senate would not consider the DC statehood bill that passed the House? Let me see how well versed anybody is. Too urban, you're close. It would, they, I see you. See, I knew, I knew my gang people were very, very smart to tune. That's right. They don't want DC to have two, two Senate seats. They feel like if, if, we get, if we gain two more Senate seats, um, that they will automatically be blue, they assume, and that will flip the control of the Senate. Now, they were saying all this, of course, before Georgia flipped it anyway, but for, but for years, that has been the argument and the sole reason why D.C. has not been granted statehood. Now, there's you know, been other small minor things, but for the most part, it has been a, a political football, right? And so once the House finally got enough co-sponsors to pass it this summer, we thought for sure um, that if we won the Senate in Georgia, then there's a very real possibility now that DC would become and be given and granted statehood. And there we have done that. We won in Georgia. Uh, Muriel Bowser, who is the current mayor, has asked that uh, President-elect Biden 
include DC statehood in his first 100 day agenda. And she is using what happened last week and her inability to be able to call upon the nation, National Guard to come down and protect us as one of the clearer cases to be made for why DC needs to be a state. We could not even fully protect ourselves last week because when she put in the request, it was delayed. No one answered, no one responded. She actually asked three days before January 6th, you know, in preparation and no one responded and left us out there with our hands tied and not able to protect our citizens and protect our residents from what was happening, what was happening and that's unacceptable. So for me, friends, I am running because I want to be that voice. I want to be the one that says, okay, we're a state now. Here's the issues that are pertinent to the District of Columbia residents. We want UBI. We want universal health care. We, you know, we want to be able to see our DC residents thrive. Here are some plans. Here's my policy platform. And now that we're a state, we're not waiting until we get it to plan on what our agenda is gonna be. We are going to take our agenda and have it prepared so that when we officially do receive statehood, we will be able to have our voice at the table and I'm running to be that particular voice. Thank you so much, <laughs> Reverend Wendy. That was very educational and informative. Um, I will open it up to questions now. So start raising your hands or typing hand in the chat and I'll start doing a queue. Um, there is like one question that I got in the chat that I'm yep. just going to, you kind of answered this with the delegate position. Yeah. Um, that delegate, is that like in the House of Representatives? Is that in the Senate? Where is that? Correct. So the delegate is in the House of Representatives. So right now we have a shadow. We have two shadow senators. <laughs> so they do have two shadow positions for us, two shadow senators, and then a, a non-voting delegate. So think about being the person, our current delegate, who has written the statehood bill, but can't even vote on it. Like, that's just, <laughs> like, really? <laughs> but I felt it was important, even if we didn't get, get statehood. And that was the other thing I was thinking about. Do I really want to go through this run? Of course I do, but, you know, just to simply be a non-voting delegate. And I thought, yes, because even having your voice on record, even being able to co-sponsor, even being able to draft bills in and of themselves have some power. So I would rather be there and getting my voice on the record on behalf of residents than, than not. So the fact mm -hmm. that we are closer to statehood now, it has, you know, has driven me even more. And I don't know yet, um, the, the, the current delegate has not refiled yet. I'm not saying that she won't. But I'm not running against Eleanor Holmes Norton. I'm running for DC. So, awesome. So we've started our queue of questions. Uh, we have Catherine up first. Yep. Um, I guess can you talk a little bit about your, um, like, in addition to UBI, what are some of your other, what else? is the kind of delegate able to accomplish for DC in the past historically through Congress? Well, you know, thank you for your question, Catherine. And that's very, um, very good question because they, they have not necessarily been able to accomplish much because everyone who runs for office in DC is consumed with the statehood topic. And so, you know, rather than asking for other things, mostly it's the mayor at this point who can request, you know, particular things for DC. Like for instance, when COVID first hit and the, the, the government was deciding how to appropriate funds to the different states, the mayor and the city put forward a budget request on how much money um, that DC would receive. And but yet they got to make the decision on what the, what the final amount was gonna be. And they shorted us, you know, more, you know, they took away more from us than they did from other states. But that being said, as the delegate, there hasn't been a lot. She, she sits on, I can only speak for her cause she's been a delegate as long as I've been here in DC, um, mainly sitting on different um, committees, um, maybe inputting information into how 
she sits on the transportation, the housing and transportation committee. So she can bring information about our, our, our you know, metro systems and making sure to advocate for, you know, adequate funding or, or to talk about cuts or things like that. So it's more of an informational position and what's been brought. There hasn't anything necessarily that's been tangibly done through that um, particular position because you are expected to just focus on getting us a state. So a lot of what the current delegate even is doing now is she's going around the house trying to get co-sponsors for this bill because you have to have a certain amount of, of co-sponsors for your bill to bring it to the floor uh, for a vote. So most of her time, you know, if she's not meeting with constituents and, and, and talking about and, and taking any questions or doing a town hall, most of the time she's lobbying her, her fellow um, house members to sign on to the statehood bill so that they can be brought to the floor. Thanks. Does that answer your question? Uh, I got a couple more, but I'll go to the back of the queue and let oh, Ethan okay. right. know, but yes, it did. Okay. Yeah, you're up, Ethan. All righty. Thank you. So good to hear from you, Wendy. Like, I can see you're very passionate about this and I hope you oh, me? <laughs> It's very exciting to kind of just like see the push to be statehood and kind of just like the ability to like confront this. I've questioned a lot about it because I've been familiar with the taxation without representation problem there. Yeah. And yep. I think it needs to be addressed. Now, in particular, I've noticed in a lot of like talks in conjunction with, uh, well, in connection with, sorry, the whole movement, how exactly would um, DC statehood be achieved necessarily and what would like the boundaries and the distinction between DC and the capital be? because the capital is still there. That's right. The, that's the big trouble from what I hear. Yeah, and there's, um, you know, and, it, and it's kind of um, outlined in the 23rd amendment that, that the federal center within DC where all the, you know, the seat of the government is sort of its own district and it, it it would have three electoral votes of its own <laughs> um and so there is some talk about what would that mean would that take away how would they allocate um you know the electoral number and votes how would that impact dc as if we become our own state would they just be considered a, a federalized district kind of separate and apart from what happens um on to us on a state level Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what but I they haven't decided yet that that that's going to have to be worked out constitutionally because of the way it's set up in the twenty third amendment. Do you have an idea as to what you would endorse in particular? <sighs> I mean, I'm uh, honestly, I, I I would endorse. I would be okay with that. I, I I really just want us to have complete autonomy from from the, the, the federal, the district itself. And that was the way it was designed. You know, DC, what we call the District of Columbia now was actually a part of Maryland. You know, if, if, if any of you all have been here, you know, we're surrounded by Maryland on this side and Virginia on this side. And um, when we separated from Maryland, some people are saying, why don't you just go back to Maryland? Why, why do you have to be your own state? Because we've grown now, you know, to a point where we have enough residents to, to be sustainable as a state. So we want to stand on our own. And so for me personally, and I'd need to study it out a little bit more just to see what kind of political ramifications that might have for us in terms of voting power. But as it stands right now, I would be okay with them retaining their three electoral votes, but they would need to figure out how to designate that and, and what that might mean um, electorally when we, you know, comes to voting and, cho and choosing. All righty, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Our next question is from uh, Robert. Hello, hi, Wendy. Um, hi, like Robert. I said in the chat, <laughs> I don't know if you remember me, I went to, I went to school in Baltimore, so I kind of have friends in DC area, from DC area, so you know, I love the area. So yeah, I, just saw, I just saw Baltimore come through the chat. I said, oh, Beemore's in the house, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> right yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, let's see, I guess my question, um, you know, thinking back on the, you know, the capital attack and, and, and whatnot, just kind of wondering, um, 
how, how would how do you how would you plan that? Let's say if it seems like the you know uh, one one party had control of the Capitol building, at least as far as security, it seems the sergeant at arms. So, mm-hmm. I mean that in itself kind of seems like a problem for me. Um, so maybe um, as a just like a precaution, maybe if we can get into the the heads of the Republicans, if they're thinking. Okay, DC is blue, DC is Democrat, and then if the Senate is also blue, then it's all blue in charge of security, which we don't have nearly the amount of extremists as the uh, red, but, uh, mm-hmm. you know, just kind of wondering if that's uh, something to be uh, like an easier solution, um, maybe two two people in charge of security somehow that don't talk to each other, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, that's a whole nother issue. And, 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 and quite frankly, as someone who has lived here in the city, so like I said, I was born and raised in Ohio. I came here to go to Howard University when I was 17 years old and I graduated from Howard and I also got my master's degree in divinity uh, from Howard School of Divinity. So I've spent my adult life here in the city from the time I was 17 years old. I did go back to Ohio for a, a brief period but for the most part, I've been in D.C. for the last 28 years. And so I consider myself a D.C. resident. And I, you know, I, I love I love my city. And let me say this to you, Robert. I I don't even necessarily think what we saw last week and how things played out was so much of a, uh, a blue red thing, because. On a regular day. You cannot get that close to the Capitol front door. I mean, I, I was oh, yeah. astonished. I was sitting here in my living room. Uh, my grandson and my daughter were here. And we were just kind of, you know, casually had the television on in the background watching the, the Senate floor vote happening. And then we started watching everything unfold. And they're showing these shots of the Capitol and people crawling over walls. I'm like, what Capitol is that? Because we can't, I live here and I can't get that close. And there's no way, I mean, Unfortunately, a few years ago, there was a young lady. They have barricades up. The Capitol Police are normally outside the entrances. And Robert, if you've been in Baltimore and you've come down here to ever to visit the Capitol, you know that you can't have that kind of access. You can walk up on the steps part of the way to take a nice picture, but you can't mm-hmm. linger there. Well, we also yeah. had a young lady um, who drove past a Capitol a police officer like drove around the barrier. She got a little bit confused or, or turned around and, and, and went to make a U-turn in her car. They shot into her car and mm. killed her. She had her infant or maybe he was, you know, somewhere between, you know, one and three years old in the car with her. They shot her thinking that, you know, she was trying to breach the Capitol. So I'm saying all that to say there was something to me a little bit more nefarious going on here in this notion that the folks that were there were even able to get as close as they got. And now that we're looking at stories coming out about police officers who were sympathetic or opening up the doors and things like that. So I, I would much more, Robert, be for a, 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 a sort of departmental review and, and over to see, you know, uh, reiterate what it is we're supposed to be doing here. Like you are here to provide protection. That's why the first heads that rolled last week were the the, the Capitol Police Chief, the House of uh, House Senate Sergeant at Arms, and the Senate Sergeant at Arms. They both got fired the very next day because regardless of whether you were red, blue, or or whatever you thought you were doing in that day, you put the entire federal government at risk by not taking this seriously. And so I think that, that it, it comes down to let's uh, come together and have a real honest, constructive debriefing about what really broke down here because there's something a little deeper than just, well, it was your Republicans in, were in charge. So we're just gonna let the Democrats be guinea pigs and just let them get eaten up. There may have been some of that, but I think it's, it's, I think it's much deeper than that. And, oh, yeah. and we're really going to have to get to the bottom of what that is to change the culture of what happened last week. And I think that's where I would start. 
Right. Oh, great. Thank, thank you so much. That was, a, that was a good answer. Yeah, it's definitely a, a deep, deep inside job with, you know, people just letting, uh, you know, vid- footage of cops just letting people through. It's, it was it was wild. Um, yeah. can't believe like it. I said, I live here. I couldn't have done that by myself on a regular day. If I had decided to walk there, I said, you know what? Because there's a whole visitor center that you have to go through to get into the Capitol itself, which is kind of sits on the back of the building. So anybody that's come to or coming to DC to visit the Capitol, you have to go through, you know, the visitor center. So the fact that these folks were able to go up the front steps with weapons. Oh, yeah. <laughs> With what I wish I would have had a gun on my hip and walked past some Capitol Police officers saying, I'm going to go find Nancy Pelosi. Lord, y'all would have been reading my obituary tonight. So, <laughs> so there's something deeper that has to be addressed in order for us to be able to move forward on that. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, next, we're coming back to Catherine again, okay. Catherine um, from Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, So one comment, I was reading a history of Alaska's uh, push for statehood. And one of the things that they did was they wrote a constitution and they they basically did the whole thing just to kind of show the government that they were serious. So that that might you guys might have already done that. And I'm just uneducated about it. Um, It'd be very interesting to you know whether or not you put it on your website or you just send it to us. It'd be very interesting to see at what state all of that stuff is um, for the folks that are pushing from that from DC. Um, second, but the question I actually had was, so when you're speaking to DC residents, yes. um, what is the kind of contrast that you draw between yourself and the current delegate to kind of say, vote for me because, you know, mm-hmm. like what are those points? Like if someone were phone banking for you, that they would make the pitch for, for you to be considered. Cause like when I'm looking up her electoral history, she pretty, like clearly wins with very like large, large margins. So, you know, what, what is that? So l- let me say this, she wins with large margins in very low turnout. Um, mm-hmm. And so there's a, there's an opening here for us and we, we crunch the numbers because, you know, if I learned anything from Andrew Yang, it's, it's, it's check the data. And so she wins um, in large margins, but if you look at the most recent primary, not the not 2020, but the most recent midterm in 2018, out of the 593,000 registered voters or, or, or not registered voters, uh, folks that are of voting age in the, in the district. So like I said, we have over 700,000, 593,000 are of voting age. And in the 2018 primary, 89,000 people voted. Hmm. That's 18.6%. That is abysmal (laughs) in terms of a turnout. Um, We've looked at that, we've examined that. And what it is, in my opinion, is that folks have become somewhat disinterested here in DC. And that's what I am hearing. You know, a lot of what I'm hearing, you know, when I'm talking to residents is, yeah, it's time for a change. and, And I appreciate that. But I'm asking them, what is it going to take to get you to come out? Because each of our wards have fairly high registration. Each of the wards have, you know, anywhere between 60 to 70% registered. So folks are registered to vote, they just don't come. And I think part of that has, has to do with they haven't felt like there was anything to um, pull them out. Every, every election is about statehood, statehood, statehood. And if that's all you've been hearing for the last 10 to 15 years and yet seen no progress in it, why, why, why then even go out? So they know Eleanor, they come out and they vote for her. So she's winning a lot based on her name recognition and just being familiar with her. And not a lot of people have, she's had challengers, but none that I am aware of that have put in place like an infrastructure, like what we're trying to do uh, and, and, and give a serious challenge um, at this point but we see an opening with the numbers. And what I would like to do to contrast myself is to say, well, first of all, I wanna find out and what I'm asking residents is why aren't you turning out? You know, what what would get you to come out? And they're saying nothing that happens, uh, you know, once you guys get to to DC, you know, get over there on the hill, y'all forget about us. You only show up when you need to vote. And what is what you're doing? What is what you are going to do as the delegate? If we made you the delegate, 
how's it going to impact my individual life? Like how is statehood going to impact me? Because what I'm finding out is that a lot of residents, they don't even know what it means. You understand what I'm saying? You've got a lot of people who are well-versed in policy and in, in politics and they, they kind of know. And some people have taken it on as a cause like, yeah, DC statehood, DC statehood. But for the average DC resident over here in Ward A who's just trying to survive and get their child some milk and some some pampers and things like that. If you ask them what 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 does DC statehood mean to you, they cannot necessarily articulate it. And I think that's where there's an opening and where I plan to contrast myself is to help advocate and educate around why having statehood will be more empowering for us and finding out from them what would you want me as your delegate to advocate for on the floor of the house when we get statehood. So we need so if I want to do UBI, for instance, yes, it's in June 2022. If I want to do UBI and I want to talk to people and say to them, universal basic income would change your life tangibly, right? You know, get them educated and up to speed, which most people now know about UBI thanks to Andrew's campaign and, and, and all that's out there nationally now. So then I can say to them, well, as the delegate, once we're a state, then I can advocate for it for just for the whole city instead of just seeing it pop up in certain wards. That's one of the things that is important to us gaining statehood. It's not just gaining statehood for statehood's sake, it's gaining statehood so that we have a stronger voice and a stronger argument for the policies that we would like to see. So universal basic income, uni uh, universal health care, some environmental justice things people are looking for, criminal justice, we want to, uh, you know, want to expand the education budget because our kids here are struggling in the area of, of going to college. I want to expand trade schools and vocational schools. So I can say to a resident, I know your son has struggled in school. I work for D.C. public schools. That's my day job. And so I see kids, not everybody's college material, and that's OK, or they don't have an interest. But I want trade brought back. I want vocational technical training and things for these uh, young men in particular, and, some, and, and quite, quite a few of these young Black men who are falling through the cracks here educationally in D.C. because they're disinterested in traditional learning, but yet they have skill sets and they have things that they could still go on to, to, to learn something successful and, and, and use that. Um, there's a lot of you know, crime you know, in different parts of D.C. that's tied to poverty in my mind. So I, I, that's the long way to say what I hope to be and what would make me different is I would continue and carry the conversation beyond statehood to what, where do we go from here? I would go beyond just simply arriving at, at achieving statehood, but have a plan in place for what to say once that goal is reached and we're closer than ever now. So we don't need to wait till we get it. We need to be prepared. And that's why I'm out here listening to residents because I want to know what you want me to say when I get there. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to run a quick time check. We have seven minutes before until 930. And I know that's the end time we gave you. Um, <laughs> so I know that we have an, uh, at least one more question in the queue from Catherine from Pennsylvania. Okay. Oh my God, that's me. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Wendy. I've got like 6,000 questions after listening to you talk. Originally, I had one. Okay. Um, the security, the, the National Guard on TV, they, they put out a lot of numbers and it, it sounds really great, but I still don't understand how people stormed the Capitol in the first place. I understand, but I don't understand. I understand because it's Trump and I heard all his cries and people answered the call. I feel a false sense of security. That's my one. But part B, just because you're fascinating, is education. Yep. We've lost it. I graduated high school in 1983. So, and I was talking to Megan earlier, I'm like, I don't know what happened to all these people. Like, you know, why aren't they educated on, on my nephew does, he's 18. He doesn't even know how to sign his name. Yes, yes. So I don't know what happened to education. And I don't wanna talk, we can talk about that another day because that's a, the most important question I think we, and why we're in this situation right now. However, since you are in DC, mm -hmm. I do have a genuine concern that 
even though it is the National Guard and they're fully armed. Mm -hmm. um, it's gonna sound a little risque, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Most of the people they show are white. Mm -hmm. Not saying that white people aren't gonna defend the country, but you know, it, it, mm -hmm. we have a white supremacist running the country. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, how do you, how, what's your honest opinion? My honest opinion is that that we we actually as residents do feel fairly safe. Now again, uh, we do this for for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I mean, this is a you know we're used to protests and counter protests. I mean, this is the the protest capital of the world, or at least the United States, I would say. So we're we're used to these drills. This one in particular, I think, hit different because this is the first time though that it came from within, right? So we lived through 9-11. We, you know, we, we lived through, I, I actually worked on the Hill briefly uh, back in 2004 when the ricin and the anthrax things were happening. And, you know, we would have to go through all kinds of drills and we would have National Guard on site and things like that. So we, we eat this stuff for breakfast. We're used to it. And, and even in this regard, yes, I definitely want to be safe and don't want to take anything for granted. But I just wish we were more proactive uh, because we tend to overreact <laughs> when we react. And, and I would rather be safe than sorry. But, but we as the residents of DC truly do kind of keep ourselves separate from what's going on. You know, all hell can be breaking loose downtown on Pennsylvania Avenue. You come about four blocks north and people are sitting outside, you know, out, outdoor dining or, or going about their daily affairs. It just doesn't phase us. You know, even if they're marching down one of the main streets, we just know how to move to the side. Oh yeah, there's another march. You just move to the side, but we still have lives to live here. So I want to assure you that within the city here, in the city proper, the residents, we're, we're not, I mean, we're going to use wisdom. You know, we're not going down town to get into any confrontations, but, but we're, you know, we're just going on about our lives and trusting and and, and, and praying that the, you know, the military and that have it under control. I was on my way home from work the other night when they first arrived. I couldn't even get from one side of the city to the other because they had it blocked off as all of these buses of National Guardsmen were coming in. And I'm just watching this with my eyes. Like, I can't believe that they're, they're responding at this level. This is probably the highest level of response I have seen. But at the same time, we know how to do this. And I think for some of them, the military and National Guard and folks, in particular, the scrutiny that they have received and some of the pushback that they have received for their lack of response last week. I mean, even when the the, the uh, permission was granted, you know, for the National Guard and other police, surrounding police off officers and agencies, they were still slow. They still took their time as if we weren't under siege. I mean, you can go back and look at it that the, the, once they got the green light to come, it's not like they rushed. They honestly, for whatever reason, did not take this as a serious threat. Now they're going back and looking at the tape and they're horrified. Now they're seeing how close we were to Nancy Pelosi and, and senators getting assassinated. These people were coming for blood. They hung gallows on the hill. They were going to hang Mike Pence because he had uh, agreed not to overturn the election. These people were coming to kill and nobody, you know, within the realm of what was happening took them seriously. But if it weren't for a few heroes, I know you guys have seen Eugene Goodman, the black officer who led them away from the Senate chamber when they were coming up the stairs, kind of chasing him. That yeah, Senate amazing. chamber door was, was, was unmanned. They could have gotten there and, and slaughtered senators who were in there hiding because they were unaware of what was happening outside. So he saved us. So I feel safe. I think we are going to be fine. I, again, I would rather them overreact, in, especially in a case like this, than not react at all. But there is going to have to be a, a, a head to toe review of procedures, of, of, of you know, of culture. And, and, and people are going to have to be honest and, and, and articulate. <laughs> I'm, I'm stuttering. I'm so... Ugh and artic whose side are you on? America's or somebody else's? Because we don't need you. We don't need to serve, love you. We don't need you to be here if you are going to facilitate or stand by why our country is under attack. You're, you're not useful in that way if that's what you're going to do. So I'm feeling good. I'm just not going to go downtown. I mean, I, I live about 15 minutes away. I, I, I can take care of what I need to take care of. Um, 
you know, um, separate and apart from having to go downtown and, and be in the midst of any of it. So we're good. We're good. Good. Are we, are we putting uh, Joe Biden in a bulletproof box and Kamala Harris? I don't even understand why they are trying to have them out there. I mean, they usually have them in front of a, uh, you know, bullet, bulletproof glass. So I believe they're still going to do that. And at this point, like I said, you can't even get near. They've got fences up with barbed wire around the Capitol. It doesn't even look the same um, as it normally would down there. So I don't know that anybody's going to be able to get close. They're going to have snipers on, on all the buildings and things like that. So I think, I think they will be fine, but I think I, I would say the less, you know, appearances they make in public, probably the better. Mm, yeah, no, I did watch it live. Um, I thank you for your time. And, you know, I will certainly be following you and, and cheering you on. You're well, fascinating. <laughs> thank you so much. Please do. I, I really appreciate, you know, all of you. And I'm, I'm happy to take it. If you had any, any other questions or anything like that, I'm, I'm happy to take them. Um, well, yeah, we are at the, the 930 mark, but if you want to stay and keep answering, I know that everyone kind of stays on a little longer for a hang or something like that. But I'm going to ask. Uh, when is the election? <laughs> so the election, the primary, actually not till June of 2022. So I've got a good 14 to 15 months to get my name, you know, recognition up and out there. That's part of the reason why we uh, joined, you know, and started early to give us enough time to build up a, you know, a campaign that was formidable. And uh, so far I've been on the campaign trail for about six weeks and, and things have been, been going very well. So I'm very pleased. Do you have any opponents? I, no one has filed yet. And, and not even the current uh, delegate has not, has not filed as of yet for 2022. You mean Eleanor? Yes, yeah, she hasn't refiled yet. Oh, so you you actually running against her? Yes. When the time come. Right. She okay. would be. Yes, yeah, she she's would be up, the primary challenger. And yeah, she's she up. Uh, twenty twenty three. She's up in twenty twenty two. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. Good to see you. Good to see you too. <laughs> My girl. <laughs> yes. I show up for you. <laughs> Uh, I think that leads me into what I think is, you know, the main question we want to ask you also is like, how can we best support you locally abroad or not abroad, but out of state? Um, like, are you phone banking yet? Or, you know, how can you really get involved as a volunteer right now? Well, so of course you can go to the website that you, you know, put up there, the link to, to sign up to volunteer. One of the ways that I, for right now, because no, we're not phone banking just yet, but we will be ramping that up here soon. But one of the best ways really folks can help me uh, from, from remote places um, other than DC is to um, comment on social media, DC based threads, really. Um, I am trying to find ways to enter into conversations. A lot of uh, folks in the DC sort of political establishment. If you will. So let me say that too real quickly. There is sort of a black political establishment here in DC that um, is one that is tribal in a sense that if you're not on the inside of them, like who are you and, and who, do you, who do you think you are running because you haven't gone through the proper channels or you haven't you know, they're very, uh, you know, connected to the DNC because it's right down the street. And so this notion that me as some outsider, you know, coming in is kind of getting a few nods, like, who is this lady? But they know, they're like, oh, I think she was with Yang. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's like, I am a progressive, a, a pragmatic progressive who is also tapping into what I believe is a national appetite for change, to move away from the traditional way of doing politics and step into fresher, newer voices. You look all over, all over the country and a number of incumbents are getting unseated. If you look at the AOCs and the Cori Bushes and you know the folks all around the country who are, are running against 
long, long time incumbents and and running their own races and coming with with a sense of having their finger on the pulse of right now. That also drove my decision to run is that there's also there's timing involved here. And I feel like the electorate is hungry for the possibility of, of, of approaching things from a different perspective. And so that is uh, one of the things that I, I hope to and feel like I'm tapping into. So that being said, if you are somebody who spends your time on different websites or news sites and you see things that come up about DC statehood, about um, things related to DC, and you want to make a comment, you know, well, I hear Reverend Wendy is running for Congress over there and she's got a policy about that. Those are the ways right now that folks who are not here in DC could be very helpful. You know, of course, I'm asking volunteers to be humanity first. Please don't get into an argument with somebody because I, uh, I had posted uh, a, a comment that one of the gentlemen from the DC City Council, matter of fact, the chairman of the council, they did a study back in 2018 and found that UBI would be too expensive for the city. But the, but the study itself was kind of bogus. It didn't really go into much detail. They just did some kind of study to say they did it. But what happened is um, I posted like the, you know, the little excerpt. I didn't tag him. I just said to, on Twitter, I said, DC council has decided that, you know, UBI is, is not feasible because we can't afford it. So, you know, immediately Yang Gang is like, who said it? So we can blast it. Who said it? I was like, no, 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 no. We're not going to do that. We're not, we're not going to do that. But, but any kind of, you know, humanity first based um, talking and exposure would be um, invaluable to me in these early stages as I am, you know, endeavoring to get my name recognition up amongst DC residents. Because at the end of the day, that's who's going to vote for me. I'll meet all the politicians. I'll do whatever I need to do to meet officials. But I'm taking my message straight to the people because it's the people that are going to put me in office, not the politicians. Uh, money, of course we need money. <laughs> you know, <laughs> money, you know, and one of the things I liked about Andrew is he always said, I remember when Mike Bloomberg jumped in the race and everybody was like, oh no, Mike Bloomberg's coming in, you know, he's got endless money. And Andrew said, but money doesn't buy passion. And so, yes, I need money, but I'm coupling that with my passion as well and hoping that that will come through. Right now, we're just getting started. So, of course, I need money for startup costs. We're trying to, uh, you know, purchase, um, I launched merchandise. That's a fundraising tool. We're trying to purchase literature because I'm going to start passing out palm cards and things like that. I've got events lined up starting all of this, you know, toward the end of this month and into February. And so what would really help me right now is, is donations of any amount because, and particularly recurring donations, I'm, I'm blessed to have a number of people who signed up to give me $5 a month, $10 a month. You, if you can't give me $100 tonight, could you give me $10 over the next 10 months? It makes all the difference in the world. So yes, I, I would like to have donations, but I'm also not feeling as though if I don't raise uh, you know, $5 billion that somehow I'm not going to be able to compete in this race because we believe that we have what it takes to win this race. And so I am asking and encouraging you to be willing to support us in this effort. Yes, of course. I lived for two years in DC, so I, I still have a few, quite a few friends there. So I'll definitely be uh, poking them <laughs> on your Thank behalf. You. And that, that would help too. If, if, if you have <laughs> friends or family or whatever, just tell them to go to my website. You can share my website with them, check them out. If they, you know, if they want to talk to me or, or they, if they want to host something where, you know, they just have a few friends that want me to come on. We're doing these, you know, intimate Zoom meetings right now with folks because we're in a pandemic and not just a fundraiser, but just information session, meet and greet. So I'm doing, you know, several virtual meet and greets. I'm asking a friend to say, okay, if you can come, can you get five of your neighbors? To, 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 you know, zoom in so that I can just meet and greet them and introduce myself and what I'm, you know, what I stand for. And so, yeah, that's how you, you all that are remote and that aren't here in DC could help me a lot in my social, social media outreach with DC specific topics or, or, or um, media, but also friends and family that you have in the area. And then certainly um, donations would be amazing. And I think that we did have a, Catherine has one more question in the queue if you're willing to take another. 
So I know it's getting my late. girl Catherine. That's all right. She get me. She get me ready for the debate. Come on, girl. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you could talk about because I know you're working with a number of groups um, to get um, different UBI pilots and and yeah. other things at the DC level. Could you yep. talk about that work because it seems like you're also going to be meeting lots of DC residents through that work and that might be how they best know you. But if you could just give us an update, I think that would be super interesting just to hear kind of the latest on the ground for the different groups you're involved with around UBI for DC. Right, wonderful, thank you, great question. So as I mentioned, in 2018, the DC City Council uh, decided to do an exploratory study around the possibility of um, a citywide UBI. And you can look online, I, I don't have that uh, link at the top of my head, but you can look up the study and, and they, pulled it together and they, they looked at it. And it, to me, it was not really a universal, but they just made the decision that it was too expensive. They didn't break it down and, and, and take into consideration what providing these monies for would, would, would make up for um, what we were missing. Um, thank you, uh, Robert, for coming on. But anyway, the study was not complete. Let me say that. But as a result, it started sparking conversations with groups within the city of, well, if we can't do it citywide, maybe we could go, you know, into some of the more distressed wards. And so you have groups like Mothers Outreach Network, who I am speaking at their monthly meeting on Thursday. They decided, well, maybe we could just be more specific and we could do a UBI to get money into the hands of mothers. This particular group is trying to help mothers who are facing possible, um, loss of their children through the, the foster care and children and family services and, and, and educational neglect offices. And so they are specifically looking at working on putting together a UBI pilot um, with that group, with those mothers um, who are encountering the foster care system or possibility of losing their children. I, I had a meeting on Friday with the East of the River Thrive group. They are a collaboration of four organizations. I'm gonna miss somebody. It's Bread for the City, um, the National Urban Institute, Martha's Table, and the 11th Street Bridge Project. Anyway, these are all nonprofits specifically here in Ward 8. I live in Ward 8. Ward 8 is the most distressed, the, high, the highest minority, lowest income uh, ward in the city. And so a lot of the resources and programs that are offered in DC are targeted toward Ward 8 residents. And so this particular initiative, East of the River Thrive, came together to provide, oh, that's it, Far East, I knew I was gonna forget somebody, the Far Southeast Collaborative. Um, they came together to um, raise monies to provide a UBI of, a certain amount, you can look it up. <laughs> I, I, I don't have the numbers um, at the top of my head, but it's been successful. Let me just say that. They have done it on a, you know, a smaller sort of sample of families um, that had to you know, qualify and they used families who were already utilizing their services, whether it was the, the you know, bread for the city or coming through the Far East, Far Southeast Collaborative, but they've been able successfully to launch their UBI pilots to this specific, you know, group of families, and they ha are collecting data now, you know, to get the results and it's been successful. So they want to expand it. And so I have been working with these groups as well, kind of trying to bring them all together because it's going to be the data from both of these groups and what they've been able to accomplish that is going to feed the larger argument and the new study that actually uh, shows that DC is capable of, of handling and distributing a UBI citywide. We can take the data that we've learned over here and we can extrapolate what would be needed, you know, for, the, for it to be a citywide program. I've been lobbying, um, as have others, uh, Muriel Bowser to get involved with the mayors for a guaranteed income. She hasn't, um, she hasn't taken, you know, any sorts of questions about it or are gone on the record in any way about it. But we're hoping that she would even be able to, you know, be willing to step up and 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 take on that program. But those are the groups so far that I've been working with, and I just feel like, however I can advocate for them, whatever information that I can provide, 
and whatever supports that I can give them, you know, based on my own work with UBI from a national perspective and what it can look like, you know, on these pilot levels, then that's what, you know, I, I, I offer to do for them. And as I said, the East of the River program has been fairly successful um, in not only providing it, but they provide more than just money. They're providing groceries, they're providing hygiene products, they're providing job training. I mean, they've they really extended it out to a number of resources that they're making available for families. But the, the, the signature piece of it is direct cash relief going into the hands of those families and then gathering data on what they've been able to accomplish as a result of being a part of this, um, of this pilot program. Thank you. <laughs> so any other questions anyone have? I haven't seen any come up at this moment, but there's been a, a fair amount of chat happening. Um, okay. <laughs> thank you so much for doing this. Uh, we typically go off, well, we'll go off the live stream and then we go into a hang. So you're also welcome to just hang with us and be a little more off the record if you'd like. <laughs> off, off the record is where we get in trouble. So nope. <laughs> uh, that's, but it's our, the off the record stuff that winds up going viral. It's, it's never the... <laughs> do we like, have, I was about to just ask, do we have any last minute questions in the room? Uh, or for whoever's watching our YouTube and our Facebook? streams but but let, let me let me say this before you know and i'll take you know one last question if you know I, I i am you know cognizant of the fact that i am taking a huge you know risk here you know in, in stepping into a, a a process that can be all consuming and you never know what the outcome is going to be but for me even much like Andrew, who, by the way, is being very supportive. God bless him. <laughs> you know, I mean, he has, you know, and in terms of just being very encouraging to me, um, you know, he's my friend. And I, you know, I'm thankful, you know, for the insight and the encouragement that he has given, even as I was leading up to thinking about doing this um, officially. And, and then I got COVID over the summer and I was, wasn't going to do it, but then I ultimately, you know, decided to do it. But I said all that to say, I am doing this because I feel called in a way to do it. I feel like this is the next chapter that God would have for my life. I am not currently pastoring our, our church wound up having to close. You know, a lot of churches are struggling around the country, maintaining attendance and, and maintaining, you know, maintenance and, and, and donations and things like that. So the attendance at the church where I had been pastoring for the last year and a half was beginning to dwindle. And so I ultimately made the decision to step down and then they have recently closed. And so I was really seeking for, you know, what was my next ministry role? What is it that God would have me to do? And so um, it dawned on me that public service is ministry. And that's why I got involved with the Yang campaign because he wasn't just running just to say, hey, I'm running for president. He was running to help and to serve people. And I'm looking at this opportunity from the same same space that's that's the passion that you hear it's like I truly do want to go up and provide my voice as a way to help and serve people particularly you know the, the residents of the District of Columbia and this is not something that you just on a hobby or on a whim say oh you know what I'm bored I'm not doing that I might as well run for all no that's not this at all <laughs> this is something that you know takes over your life you know for the period of of campaigning and things like that and so I'm very humbled in doing it, but I'm very also resolved because I also know that I feel like it's bigger than me. It's, it's, it's more about the message. And so I'm, I'm just very um, excited. I'm very grateful, very humbled and thankful um, to be on this journey. So come with me and help me so we can win. <laughs> I think I speak for all of us when I say like, we are so excited that you are running, that you are putting your voice forward, your amazing spirit, and we are very excited to support you in the next, what did you say, 14, 16 months? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> here we are halfway through January now, yeah. so, you know, we're getting into February, and that's what I know is going to go quick, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It, it might be a year, but it's going to go just like that, so yeah, I, I appreciate it, but I, I think getting the early start is, is the right thing to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
<laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, we All have right. no questions from the YouTube or the Facebook. So okay. that's good. Um, Thank you. I guess we'll, we'll end the live. Or yeah, I'll let you close out whatever you want to say. Well, the question I just wanted to ask: Will will there be a link to this somewhere where I can post it, or is this um, just for tonight? Oh, absolutely! It's streamed on our YouTube, and it stays there, so it'll be there. Okay. As well as uh, Facebook, it's streamed oh, okay. on there. Um, okay. And then, actually, sometimes what I do afterwards is um, when I minute manage to find a moment. <laughs> Thankfully, we have a year. <laughs> I will like, you know, some like really inspirational moments or informational moments. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to like cut down into little short video clips that are like okay. easier to share than watching a whole hour plus interview. Um, oh, that so would be fantastic. I'll send those over to you at some point as well. <laughs> this is why I love the Yang Gang. This is why I love them. This is, the, 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 the talent is endless. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And I don't have any other parting. I, I've talked enough. Um, I don't have any other parting words to say other than thank you for your time. Thank you for the platform. And as a matter of fact, uh, you know, Humanity First, you were the ones who helped connect that meeting with East, the, East of the River Thrive. So I thank you for, you know, inviting me to, to be a part of that conversation. And we continue conversation even beyond that, that initial meeting. So I, I appreciate all the efforts that you all have already shown in supporting my campaign. So thank you. <laughs>